concern um, the pioneer, shall we say, uh, in the European context. Uh, definitely the modernism, what it is called modernism in architecture, um, has his hometown uh, in, in Europe. We have seen that um, Frank Lloyd Wright and other a pioneer in the in American context uh, uh, precede of several decades uh, the experiment of Europe. But what it is now called the modernism itself definitely starts from Europe, uh, from the work of some key personalities. In between many uh, great architects and artists at that time, we select um, uh, just uh, six or seven, no more, because of the um, complexity of the scenario is quite, um, is quite uh, big. Uh, we select uh, uh, authors like uh, Walter Gropius, uh, Le Courbusier, Adolf Loos, Miss van der Rohe, uh, Gerrit Rietveld. Uh, and uh, some special cases of uh, the expressionist architecture. And uh, finally, we will uh, note uh, a very peculiar architect, which is uh, Luis Barragan from Mexico. And this is uh, uh, unusual, but it deserves to be mentioned in this, uh, in this um, quick, um, quick review. Shall we start with Gropius? Uh, Gropius was a very talented young architect and uh, probably one of the father of the modernism. Uh, his approach, extremely rational, extremely logic, extremely functional, make us cool. Probably we can say that the, uh, the old modernist architecture has is a deeply root into his methodology of work. Definitely one of the most important um, buildings which characterized the, the early uh, examples of the modernism is the uh, Fagus factory, made in 1911 in Germany. Uh, this is a, a factory, of course, uh, so it seems that um, there is no need of any specific uh, um, architectural features, but uh, on the opposite, the approach of Gropius um, is very interesting because it joined the, the quality of the architecture, the quality of the design, uh, the good outlooking and organization, uh, functional organization of the building with the functionality of a factory. In the past, before the example of Gropius, but also in the recent years, the factory usually are considered just a big pavilion, anonymous, just uh, big and cheap. The approach of Gropius was quite different because Gropius gave a dignity uh, even to a very simple factory. The approach of Gropius was definitely rationality, what nowadays we call functionalism. Functionalism, in this case, it means a precise answer which follow the function that a certain building need. In the case of the Fagus factory, there are two main blocks, the office administration building and the production line. Uh, the image of the building is very uh, famous. Uh, it is extremely uh, net, very clean. Uh, it concerns a big glass facade, which is quite unusual for the time, and two lateral entrance, um, quite solid, which block the volume of the um, office building. In, this, uh, in, in the approach of Gropius, we find something quite um, important and it needs a very special explanation. In many uh, dissertations concerning modernist, modernist architecture, we have a certain kind of ambiguity in between rationalism, modernism, functionalism and purism. The architecture of Gropius, Le Corbusier, Miss van der Rohe, uh, and other great master, it is considered rationalist architecture. It is called rationalist architecture. But it is necessary to point out some differences. Rationalist architecture, in the definition, it means a architecture which is created to give a rational answer, logic answer, to specific problem. For example, the organization of the inner space, for example, the light, for example, the cost, the functional organization in between the different parts, the organization of the plan. That is called rationalist approach. But the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, which is not rationalist, 
which is called organicist architecture, it is not a madness. Also, it has a very strict rationality in the organization. Even the architecture of uh, liberty, for example, or the great engineering work in the 18th, 18th, 19th century, they are very rational, but they are not called rationalist architecture. So this is a, a little bit ambiguity. Shall we say that, in conclusion, that the rationalist architecture it is every form of architecture which rationally, and not emotionally, but rationally solve functional problems. And then we have another definition, which is necessary to point out, purist architecture. Again, the rationalist architecture and very often the modernist architecture, it seems to be the architecture which has the pure volume, white color, simple form, Le Corbusier, by the way, which is not actually. The purist architecture is the architecture which uses the aesthetic, the form of cubism in architectural field. If you notice a very important detail, Le Corbusier started his career as a painter, um, which can be defined as a purist painting. Simple for, minimalist, light color, very, very simple composition pure form. This is why uh, this is, it is called purist architecture, purist painting, and then purist architecture. So every time we are in front of architecture which has a very net form, cubic base, white color, the Weissnoff uh, Siedlungen, for example, then in that case we can call purist architecture. But please don't have any confusion. Rationalist architecture, it is not purist architecture. And again, modernist architecture, it is not the purist architecture. Then we have another uh, interesting definition to point out, what it is called functionalism. Functionalism is something much bigger, because of functionalism, we repeat again, it is the approach that intend to solve with uh, logic, scientific, scientific approach, the problem concerning the function of a building. So, in fact, everything is a functionalist because every architecture should answer a very specific function, a very specific demand uh, from the client. Of course, in the history, there are some architecture which intentionally uh, are created to don't be functional. Something like, for example, the Bomarzo, the architecture of Bomarzo Park. But it is a completely different topic. It is something which is based on emotion, illogic, poetic. But uh, most of the cases, the architecture have to be functional and not emotional, except some uh, specific situation which is not common. Coming back to the idea of Gropius, we have to say that uh, the, the approach of Gropius include several um, ideas that we point out before. The architecture of Gropius is definitely functional, precise answer to specific problem to solve precise functional problem. It is based on a very rational and scientific approach, lighting, for example, cost control, um, use of the material, and we can say in, it's also purist because several buildings of Gropius uh, has a very, very net, very, very clean outlooking. But what it is impressive in Gropius, in Gropius is the methodology of the approach. This kind of methodology is so important that it becomes a school. Everyone knows, it's very famous, the Bauhaus School, Bauhaus Schule in German. The Bauhaus is um, probably one of the most important schools of architecture in the ho uh, whole uh, 20th century. Um, the Bauhaus was directed by Gropius first and then by Miss van der Rohe lately. And then finally it was closed uh, during the uh, rising of the Nazi party in, uh, in Germany. Uh, the building of the Bauhaus Schule, it is uh, 
typical case of rationalist architecture. Rationalist, functionalist and purist. The plan completely abandoned the idea of symmetry. If we remember the previous class, we have seen that in the neoclassic architecture, generally speaking in the classic architecture in general, but also in the, um, in the eclectic architecture with also some cases of in Richardson, for example, one of the approach of the architect is the symmetry. The left side of the building is specular to the right side with a central axis. Well, in the picture, um, in, the, in the composition, in the picture of the, of the Bauhaus Schule, Bauhaus School, um, there is no symmetry. It seems like a spiral. It's very dynamic. Uh, this one, it is generated by a functional demand. For the first time um, since uh, in the history, every building was designed to answer a specific demand, a specific function. This is why functionalist architecture. If in the classic architecture the idea of outlooking uh, was uh, a key point, there are some classic rules to follow, for example, the classic order, the decoration. In this way, the facade was not free. The facade should follow the idea of symmetry, have to be arrhythmic, in order, have to be according with some specific mathematical rules, very, very rigid. For example, Palazzo Farnese of Michelangelo, by Michelangelo in Rome, it is a very symmetric facade, very, very ordered. But in the case of um, um, the Bauhaus Schule, uh, the, the building of Bauhaus, there is no symmetry. There is, uh, it seems to be, mm, there is no order. The body of the building looks like uh, um, a spiral, like a snake, uh, based on the rectangular uh, angles. Uh, but the reason is, every different blocks of the building has a specific function and every specific function demand a form. If you remember the logic of Louis Sullivan, form follow the function, well, that kind of golden rule of the modernism here is perfectly respected. The general form of the building, but also the organization, but also the design of the window, the facade, the structural system, the entrance, everything, follow a specific function. There are classes, there are office building, there are public space. Everything is different. Every function has to be according with specific demand. And every function has his own outlook. This is a kind of very important rule in all the experience of the modernism. Walter Gropius designed great masterpiece in all his career. And um, during, the, uh, during the Second World War, during the dictatorship of uh, Hitler in Germany, he moved to US. And in the new world, they start to create, um, start to create a very beautiful and very interesting building, something like uh, the Harvard Graduate Center, made in 1950. Now, here we touch a sensitive point. His methodology was so strict, so good, so uh, functional. The performance was so good that that methodology became the rule in the old 1950, 1960, and 1970. So if the, in the, at the beginning of 20th century, when Walter Gropius started his career in Germany, that methodology was extremely innovative, then finally, after the Second World War, the, that approach became too rigid. In the hand of the master, in the hand of Walter Gropius, it made masterpiece. But in the hand of less talented architect generate disaster. Some one of you probably remember what it is called the international style. And this is what, what, one of the most, uh, uh, the, one of the disaster of the 20th century in terms of architecture. The international style 
it was basically generated by a wrong, the misuse, wrong use of the methodology of Walter Gropius. Once again, the master can create masterpiece, but the wrong use of a tool, the wrong use of a methodology create a monster. This is a typical of uh, the history of human being. The international style, it is uh, um, the architecture uh, which become international. It means the methodology, the rationalist and the functionalist architecture become the standard in every part of the world. Somehow, it is a kind of uh, food good for everyone. It is a kind of uh, architecture, method, style, design, language, which was valid for every corner of the world, from very hot climate to a very cold climate, without any consideration for the local identity, for the local culture. For example, when you see some building completely made by glass, uh, created in between 1960 to 1980, well, that one is international style. A glass facade not necessarily is good. In most of the cases, bad. In the hot climate or in the uh, cold climate, a glass facade is simply a disaster in terms of climatization, in terms of lighting, in terms of environmental degradation. So it's very bad. But it becomes a rule. And uh, this, uh, this problem was created uh, by the misuse of the method of Gropius and Ms. van der Rohe. We, have, we will see some cases also of Ms. van der Rohe. The building made by glass, this is another sensitive point during in the discussion of the modernism, it is considered modern, advanced, innovative, right? Even today. But it is only language. It is only a style. It is not true that modernity or modern or contemporary necessarily have to be created by glass. Glass is a very old material, date back uh, 2000, um, over 2,000 years. But the outlooking, the crystal, the aesthetic of the pure form, the brightness of the glass, give the impression to be a modern material. This is why we have a proliferation, we have a, a overproduction of glass facade everywhere in the world. And in terms of performance, climate, uh, climatization is very bad. So everything was originated by a misuse of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the method of Walter Gropius. The second author, a giant in the 20th century, is of course Le Corbusier from Swiss. Um, he is probably the most important architect in the whole 20th century in terms of influence. I'm not talking about terms of quality. I'm not talking in terms of um, uh, um, result because that one is much more personal. Uh, but in terms of influence, definitely is um, extremely important in the good and the bad side. Le Corbusier become, um, is very famous in the world for uh, some key um, masterpiece. In architecture, uh, we won't only mention uh, three or four of his uh, great building. Uh, it is necessary to, dis to discuss about Ville Savoie, because uh, Ville Savoie um, become one of the icons of the modernist architecture. The appearance is extremely modern, even today. Even today could be considered a very advanced design. It includes all the five points of architecture, which become the manifesto for uh, the, the old modernist uh, architecture in, in all the world. It is extremely light. It, has, uh, it is basically perfect in terms of uh, uh, ratio, in terms of composition, in terms of function. It is simply beautiful. And it is beautiful also become what it is called an icon in the uh, modernist um, uh, architecture world. It is a, a milestone for old architect. Um, we have to study this, this work, not only in terms of appearance, which is important, but not the most important, but also in terms of um, composition. The building is completely suspended. 
There is a basement with the parking lot, parking, parking place, some functional rooms, and then all the house is suspended on the second and um, on the second floor. On the third floor, there is a, a garden, or better, a terrace. This element lately become present also in the other building of Le Corbusier, something like the Unité d'Habitation, but in a much larger scale. What is the idea of Le Corbusier, which is constant in all the world? The idea it was quite, um, uh, quite good, very, very nice, frankly speaking. Um, first of all, he noticed something quite uh, important. The city, the suburbs, are going to eat the countryside, the landscape. So his idea is to suspend all the building on pillars and create a continuous garden instead of the city. So it's a kind of floating city. Everything was suspended on pillars, what in France he called piloti, pillars, very light, very light column. In uh, Ville Savoie, we find exactly this point. There are all the villas suspended on pillars, the piloti. There is only a very small basement, and the houses seem floating on the air. The same appear, for example, in the Unité d'Habitation. Le Corbusier created several Unité d'Habitation. Uh, this one it is in Marseille but there is another one in, in, uh, in Berlin and many others around the world. The Unité d'Habitation was intentionally created as a compact city. Instead, to have a lot of villa with his own private garden, which, for example, is the typology, the typical typology in, um, in uh, Santa Monica uh, or in the suburbs of America, in many cities of America, but also in Italy and Europe, that is quite common. Uh, Le Corbusier said that this is a simply a waste of land. It is much better to concentrate everything in one building and uh, let the nature, the park, uh, grow naturally around. In this case, what happened is the city, it is not spread horizontally, but it is vertical. This is a very um, interesting idea that also lately Frank Lloyd Wright used for uh, his Broadacre city. On the contrary of Le Corbusier, who create a big block, a kind of wall, Frank Lloyd Wright create a skyscraper, one mile tall. But the idea is the, is the same. No more city, which occupy all the territory, but concentrate everything in only one building and let the rest of the territory become empty and green. It is a great idea. The Unité d'Habitation was also extremely rational in terms of the organization. The apartment was created by duplex, one floor and half with internal stairs, a long corridor in the core of the building, and on the top, the terrace, which is used for functional, uh, functional stuff, something like laundry or uh, similar, and a playground for child. So, great idea. This is a typical of Le Corbusier. A programmatic idea, uh, a very, very rational approach, uh, great quality of design, great color, basically masterpiece of art. Unfortunately, art is art and architecture is architecture. In many cases, those buildings, it doesn't work, as well as all the urban planning of Le Corbusier, which has a, a serious problem, actually. Uh, Sometimes his ideas were utopistic. He uh, created some plan for South America where the city doesn't exist anymore, but the city are concentrated only in one big wall, a building city. The rest of the territory was completely natural and all the function become um, concentrate in one single architecture. Uh, it has the influence, of course, with the urban planning of uh, Soria Imata, which we cannot um, uh, investigate in this moment. Uh, but uh, basically the plan is not very good. 
the approach of Le Corbusier, which was uh, you know, widespread uh, around all the world in terms of urban planning and zoning and so on, definitely was very weak uh, on the practical um, uh, on the practical manner. Great theoretical idea, but in fact uh, generate disaster. So. Le Corbusier was very influential, also in a negative point. Uh, the Unité d'Habitation in the hand of Le Corbusier is a masterpiece. In the hand of common architects generate catastrophe. So the Unité d'Habitation that you, you, you can see in these pictures, it's a good work, it's beautiful, it's well made. Uh, the quality of the architecture is nice. But how many buildings like this you have seen in your life with a very low quality of construction, with a very low quality of, the, of design, with a very low quality of social environment? And this one becomes basically ghetto, what it is called a ghetto, um, with a social problem, a social conflict, a criminality, segregation, so very bad. But probably... The mistake is not uh, made by Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier get a good idea. The misuse of this idea generate again disaster. Very often Le Corbusier is considered a very cold blood architect, a very rationalist and so on. But we have to mention at least uh, uh, two or three buildings which rationalists are not. Of course, one of the greatest masterpieces of architecture, which is the uh, Ronchamp Chapelle in Swiss. This is a, a simply a piece of art in the form of a building. It is a church, a very beautiful church with a, a miraculous uh, sense of light. Uh, the form is very unusual. It is a kind of sculpture. Few people know that these, uh, the, the outlooking of the um, uh, of the church was generated taking inspiration from a sketch of the German architect Hans Scharun. There are evidence on that, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that Le Corbusier copy Hans Scharun. Take inspiration because this is architecture and art. Inspiration by others always continuous modification. The Ronsham Chapelle, it is one of the most beautiful and iconic and famous building around the world. Uh, the space inside is simply fantastic. And it is a quite interesting, um, the situation that it looks like an expressionist work. Several authors always oppone, and in my opinion this is wrong, organicism, expressionism and um, rationalism. Two kind of school, organic expressionism from one side and rationalist from another side. I completely disagree. There is no radical opposition in between the two because some authors are at the same time very rational in the composition but also very creative, very unusual in the form. Le Corbusier it is one of them. Le Corbusier, which is one of, who is one of the father of the rationalist architecture, purist architecture, and also functional architecture, in this church was completely artistic. There is no needs, no functionality, no rationality in those kind of strange form, in the sloping wall, in the curved roof. It is simply poetic. And this is why the quality is so high. So I want to remark that this building is very important because it links together different approach of architecture. Finally, Le Corbusier went to uh, India and created some of very important masterpiece of architecture. Uh, this is a Chandigarh, of course, and um, uh, again, it is a very strict functional program uh, which generates the building, a rational approach, excellent organization of the of the space, but there are some elements which are simply poetic and beautiful. Which one is the most prominent? Like Le Corbusier said, light. So if you want to uh, uh, find the um, one key rule in the architecture of Le Corbusier, it, it is definitely the function, yes, it is definitely the uh, great organization of the space, but especially it is the light. 
This is one of the most, uh, um, the greatest lessons from Le Corbusier. I want to mention one last work. Uh, many years after Le, Le Corbusier passed away, uh, the local administration of uh, the city of Firmini intend to realize a church which Le Corbusier sketched when he was alive. And this is the Firmini uh, Chapelle. Why I won't mention this, uh, this work? The quality is, of course, extremely high. It is uh, simply a beautiful work, artistic, based on the same sense of emotional space of uh, Ronchamp. But uh, I won't mention one specific point. This building was created a few years ago by a master which was already passed away uh, for decades. But this building, it is still very advanced in terms of design. It is much more modern than many contemporary living masters. And this one is a, the signature of Le Corbusier, a simply a genius in the old 20th century. The, other, the third author in the pioneer in the Europe, it is Adolf Loos. So Adolf Loos from Austria uh, is um, sometimes a um, not very well recognized genius. Um, I want only show a couple of work, uh, the famous Steiner House and the Rufer House, no more. Why? Because these are two buildings are extremely important in the history of modernist architecture. If you look at the picture, it seems quite uh, simple, even banal. Adolf Loos was a very talented architect and uh, his formation was in uh, Austria, in Vienna, in one of the most important period uh, for the flourishing of the culture in Europe. We have to remember that uh, uh, Vienna uh, in Austria was one of the core of the culture in all Europe in between the end of the uh, 19th century and beginning of 20th century. In architecture, for example, at the end of 19th century, we find the Wagner Schule, the school of Wagner, Otto Wagner, a great uh, master in architecture. He was a Jugendstil architect, but also based on a very rational approach. His building was uh, really magnificent. Um, there is the uh, Jugendstil movement with uh, Josef Maria Olbrich or Hoffmann, for example, uh, another great master of architecture. Adolf Loos, so it is very important for us because uh, has a key idea in architecture which uh, will generate the purest uh, language in, in the building and also a very rationalist approach. What we intend with these terms? If we check the architecture of Otto Wagner and um, uh, Josef Hoffmann, for example, but also Josef Maria Olbrich, they are very decorated. Uh, they are the sign of the uh, end of 19th century. Unfortunately, we have no time to discuss those great masters, but the decorative feeling was very close to uh, what happened for Victor Horta in, in, in Bruxelles. On the contrary, Adolf Loos radically reduced, radically clean up every form of decoration. For in, in his opinion, his famous sentence is, uh, ornament is a crime. What does it mean? It means that it's simply useless. Decoration are useless. We must create architecture simply following a precise uh, function. The architecture must be the expression of the internal function of the building. The Steiner house, it's, um, it seems very banal. If we look with the, the feeling of today, it is really nothing, nothing special. It is a quite simple form, white color. The plan is very, very simple. There is no specific um, quality. Uh, why it is considered a masterpiece of architecture? Exactly because it is simple. Exactly because it is banal. This building was made in 1910. At the same time, the Jugendstil, Liberty, or uh, this kind of uh, very flourishing and hyper-decorated style uh, was around. 
The approach of uh, Adolf Loos was simply to clean up everything. It was one of the first. Uh, the purest language of Adolf Loos, even very arid, very dry, uh, was unconventional. Thanks of his work, all the future architecture become very, very net, become very, very clean. There is another very important point that we can uh, find out in, in these pictures. If you check, the position of the window are unusual. There is no apparent order in the composition of the facade. There is no geometry. There is no mathematical rule, on the contrary of the classic architecture, which was generated by written. In this case, it seems everything in disorder. Is it a disorder? No, of course. It is the mirror of the function inside the building. We have to remember that the functionalist architecture was created to answer to precise requests or needs of the client. Every client is different and every client has his own needs. This is why the building generated by Adolf Loos are always different, because different are the needs of the client. The needs of the client generate the plan of the building. The plan of the building have to be different for every floor. And then, consequentially, the windows on the facade cannot be the same in every floor. This is the reason why. But there is another very important point, even probably more important. Uh, we can find this rule in a roofer house made in 1922. The building is simply not very interesting from outside. It looks a very common building, even ugly. But what is important in this case? If we check the facade, we find something unusual. The floor is not divided in the first, second, third floor, but we have a kind of um, variation. There are what it is called the middle floor. First floor, then there is a half floor, uh, in between, there is a one floor in between the first and the second. Uh, this kind of section is unusual. Well, there is a precise name to de define uh, this kind of composition. Um, Adolf Loos call it Raumplan, which in German means uh, the planning of the space. Yes, because exactly be, um, for the reason that he create a plan of the building, he sketch, design the building, where every floor is different because different are the needs on different floors, also the section cannot be too simple. The section should have half a floor in terms of the, very movable, very, with a variation in terms of high. Exactly like, for example, in Frank Lloyd Wright, which use compression and release. Well, this is a simple idea to generate half floor, or better, to switch the floor um, irregularly, it is uh, one of the key features of the modernist architecture, which is not divided clearly in between different um, floor one, floor two, floor three, but there are a uh, freedom also in the section. And here we touch a very important point in the modernist architecture. If in the past the architecture was designed by plan and then facade, for the first time the architecture it is designed also by section. What does it mean? When the architect approach the design of architecture uh, by, um, by sketches, they first design the plan, they organize the function, and after they start to generate the composition of the facade. But very often could be very useful to articulate the complexity of the space also thanks of the section. So the section is no more a passive result of plan plus facade, but become an element which to take into, into consideration during the design itself. And then the architecture and the space is much more complex. So from Le Courbusier and Adolf Loos, we take two very important lessons. Key feature of the architecture is space and light, and that is the core of the modernist architecture. 
When we approach the work of Miss van der Rohe, then we are in front of one of the most influential architects of the, of the 20th century. Generally talking, his architecture it is called minimalist. What does it mean, minimalist architecture? The architecture reduced the minimal element, minimal possible element for generate architecture. And his work was really impressive since the very beginning. In 1907, he created one um, building, quite banal, real house, not really very interesting, um, common, common residential house. But then in 1927, he had a big jump, big step forward. He was uh, the um, main architect for the Weisnoff Siedlungen um, in, uh, in Stuttgart. Several architects were invited in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, project, in this district, like uh, Hans Scharun, for, the young Hans Scharun, for example. Uh, the work of Miss um, um, van der Rohe here was very important because he created purist language. It is still not his own feature, which appeared a um, few years after, but... Uh, uh, his work is always characterized by an, an extremely simplification of the form. Uh, what makes the, uh, the language of Miss um, uh, van der Rohe uh, more unique start from uh, 1928 Lange House, a house made by bricks, but where the composition was reduced also to the uh, even more essential even more uh, simple uh, elements. Few walls, um, very, very simple composition, but at the same time, extremely dyna dynamic. But the big step forward, which characterized all the architecture of Miss van der Rohe lately, and also the all um, 20th century architecture, especially in the minimalist language, it is the pavilion, the German pavilion in uh, the exhibition in Barcelona. 1929. In the case of the, um, um, the German pavilion in, Bar in Barcelona in 1929, we find all the element of the minimalist architecture that become a constant uh, in all 20th century and it is very popular uh, even today. So what does it mean, minimal, uh, minimalist architecture? Well, minimalist, it means something minimum the minimum possible element to generate uh, uh, architecture. If we analyze this building, we can't find any room, any boundary, any wall. Everything is suspended. There is a continuous glass facade around the whole building and uh, the plan is uh, very, very simple. Um, the architecture is uh, almost disappearing. But at the same time, the space is very, very clear in terms of usage. Now, um, I think uh, uh, that this kind of trend in architecture, even today, it is very strong. Uh, it is a very precise uh, um, uh, kind of architecture, which again, it is called minimalist architecture. There are great avatars, something like um, Campos Baeza in Spain, and... Uh, the architecture is uh, very, very calm. Uh, the space are simple and um, they are simple in terms of composition, but actually the relationship in between the different parts of the building are quite complex. So minimalist doesn't mean banal. Minimalist seems um, it means uh, everything is suspended. How to reduce the language of architecture, the element of the composition, as minimum as possible, as less as possible. In um, uh, Tugendhat House, made in 1930, we have uh, uh, another example, probably less simple than the Barcelona Pavilion, but the um, composition is uh, quite mature. It means uh, it, it is a perfectly functional house, again, based on very simple language. Uh, the wall basically disappear. Uh, there is a continuous space uh, in between the different uh, different part of the of the house, but in uh, Tugendhat house we still have the idea of the rooms, which is the partition, uh, 
which part, uh, have the, give the partition of the different uh, functional space. Um, uh, lately, you know, with the minim when the minimalist architecture was developed during 1970-1980, probably the architect came back to the Barcelona Pavilion, become, become much more um, simple and much more, again, minimalist. The last building of Mr. Leroy that we want to quote is um, the Seagram Building in uh, New York, made in 1959, one of the latest projects of Miss. In this case, we are in front of one of the prototypes of the international style. A very simple volume, a mostly glass facade, quite simple composition, and once again, if this language works very well in the hand of the master, in the hand of the common architect generate disaster. Our city are basically destroyed by those kind of um, meaningless building. If the masterpiece is unique, well, that is definitely fine. But if the same prototype is repeated um, several times, it generates the uh, indifference of the landscape. The very last building that we won't mention of Ms. van der Rohe is the uh, new National Gallery in Berlin. Um, it is a very important project in terms of history of architecture. It contains all the elements of the minimalist um, uh, building of Ms. van der Rohe, a huge uh, steel frame um, roof suspended by uh, eight pillars, and a glass facade, but actually the museum is underground, so it is a kind of cover, uh, a cover on a huge platform. It is a kind of crystal, and again, it dates back to the idea of the uh, glass arch architecture by Paul Sherbert, a very influential book uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. In this moment, uh, we have uh, to discuss about one very special trend in architecture, which is the expressionist, uh, the expressionist architecture. Now, expressionism is a trend of art and um, uh, very, very popular in Germany at the beginning of 20th century. It is a form of avant-garde. The expressionism in painting, in art, it is uh, it's based on the poetic of express the inner feeling of the artist. So sometimes his feeling is quite strong, quite um, uh, violent. And this is why the expressionism art sometimes is very sharp, uh, even ugly, even uh, disgusting sometimes. Uh, something like the painting of uh, Otto Dix. Um, they represent the worst part of the humanity, the rotten meat, uh, the, the ugly feelings, caring, violence, war, uh, corruption. But this is why it is extremely important in the um, 20th century, because it has expressed in a very direct language a very strong feeling, which is the key element in the 20th century. The expressionist architecture uh, has a similar a poetic compared with art. The architecture sometimes is really strong, is violent sometimes, is very impressive. Um, personally speaking, I like very much and uh, on my formation has a very strong uh, influence. Um, and this is why I want to propose to, the, uh, to, the, um, to my student and to the old um, people uh, the expressionist architecture, which is, which is a chapter of the modernist architecture, which is not very well known. One of the prototypes of the old system is um, uh, Bruno Taut Glass House, made in 1914. Um, this building it is made for an exhibition um, and um, for, for a fair, public fair, and uh, it is made uh, to celebrate the quality of the glass in architecture. Before that, the architecture was made mostly by stone, bricks, uh, wood, but no one considered the glass as the main material for the architecture. Bruno Taut make a statement. The glass will be the material for the future. He was right. If we consider, for example, the architecture of today, how many glass facades, how many windows are compo composing the architecture today, then definitely his provision was correct. A very important uh, author, uh, which built very, very few architecture, but uh, uh, he was extremely influential in terms of idea, is Hugo Herring. Uh, his uh, building in, in uh, Siemensstadt in Berlin, 
um, in the in the twenties. Um, it doesn't look very interesting actually. Uh, but I want to show you because his importance lies in the theory. He was the master of several great architects, something like um, uh, Hans Scharun, for example. And um, uh, his book uh, was very, very well written and uh, proposed some key idea in the expressionist architecture. A very important author, um, not really very, um, very famous around the world, it is uh, Fritz Höger. Um, the uh, cigarettes factory in Hamburg, made in 1926, uh, is a real masterpiece in, um, in architecture and is extremely detailed in terms of treatment of the facade. If you look at this picture, uh, we, you can understand the quality of the use of the bricks. And this is a very special bricks. It is a pop very popular in Germany. It is very, very dark a color, but at the same time very bright. It, is, it was made for build uh, Berlin, for example, in around 1910-1920. So this is a very special material because it's a dark but bright. Um, another very important um, project of um, uh, Fritz Höger is the Kiele House, in, again in Hamburg, 1921-1924. It looks like a big, huge ship, a boat, which floating in the middle of the city. Uh, the appearance is very strong, very aggressive, quite uh, brutal, but this is called expressionist architecture. At the same time, it is um, very massive, but also the quality of the detail is very important. This is a very interesting project, again made by uh, Fritz Höger. It is um, a project of a skyscraper, um, uh, 250 meters tall, which is remarkable at the time. It's very simple in the design, but again, extremely um, beautiful uh, in, um, for the expressionist architecture. Here we are in front of another project, very important, uh, made by Hans Pölzig, 1903-1907, uh, the municipal building uh, of Lovenberg in Germany. It looks like a typical German traditional architecture and is not very important, but um, the, um, the dam in Klindenberg, in, made in 1908, show all the power of the composition in the expressionist architecture of Pölzig. Pölzig is one of the key authors in the expressionist architecture and one of the most uh, prominent architects in Germany at that time. This is uh, the shopping mall, uh, Steiner and Zahn. Um, and uh, it looks, again, very modern. Uh, it is built a few years after um, uh, uh, Louis Sullivan uh, shopping mall, but uh, it is even more modern. It is, very, it, it, has a, it is based on a curved angles and um, very dynamic. And it is, all the prototype, it is a prototype for all the building, for example, of Erich Mendelssohn. This is a very important sketch. Uh, it is, uh, again, made by Hans Polsing, and they are the uh, background the, uh, for the tragedy Hamlet by Shakespeare. It looks like childish uh, uh, sketching, but actually this is a typical of the expressionist art and architecture. This is a very important uh, project of Pölsi. This is the uh, decoration for the, uh, the, the movie Der Golem, made in 1920. And uh, it is a kind of oneric, a very, maybe a kind of nightmare uh, forms. The movie is very beautiful and uh, again, very impressive. It is the same style of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Uh, very visual, very dramatic, um, kind of uh, uh, nightmare dream, um, but quite important uh, in terms of visual approach and expressionist architecture. This is uh, Hans Pölzig, the um, competition for the Soviet um, palace in Moscow, 1931. Why this is important? First of all, because it's completely made by glass. Uh, yes, because uh, Hans Pölzig become very famous in the, in the 20th century for one um, important project. Unfortunately, now it is destroyed. It is the Gross Schauspiel House, made in 1919. In, uh, in Germany, and uh, it was uh, completely decorated by glass. So it's a kind of a casca uh, fall, it's a kind of cascade made by, by, by glass. It's a falling water completely made by glass.
uh, it's a waterfall, a freezing waterfall. You can imagine the effect with the electric light at that time. Uh, this building was destroyed. Uh, the foyer it was made by curved surface, uh, which it seems like a cave. And this kind of dramatic effect is uh, typical of the um, expressionist architecture. Now we must attach another very important architect, who is um, Erich Mendelssohn. Erich Mendelssohn, during the war, the First World War, he made what it is called um, imaginary sketch. Immense building, curved, magmatic, extremely powerful in their visual. And but this is uh, the, the very beginning of his uh, um, uh, creation, which uh, finally uh, reached one of the top uh, uh, of his uh, composition in the, the uh, Einstein Turm. It is the laboratory of Albert Einstein in Potsdam, made in 1920-1924, before Einstein was forced to uh, escape in first in Swiss and after in US, because of the German dictatorship. This building is um, one of the most important uh, architecture in the 20th century. It is based uh, on uh, curved surface. And why curved surface? Because uh, we have to remember that Mendelssohn, because he was in touch with um, uh, with Einstein, was one of the promoter, one of the guy who explained the theory of relativity to large audience. Um, this is uh, um, this building is programmatic. He intend to express in architectural form and in space the theory of relativity. One of the element of the theory of relativity is curved space. Curved space, not curved surface. This is very different. Curved space is much more complex idea than curved surface. A curved surface is very simple. I take a flat piece of paper and I twist. This is a curved surface. But a curved space, it is much different because the whole space becomes curved. So this architecture it is deformed in the uh, intention of the architect, not in terms of sculptural intention, but in terms of expression of curved space. This is why this building is very important. The architecture of um, Erich Mendelssohn uh, come across for over 30 years. He made some remarkable piece of architecture, um, something like the, uh, the Zade Berlin Tageblatt, the, um, one, um, one newspaper, uh, a building for a newspaper, German newspaper at that time. The, 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 the composition of the corner is really very um, fluent, uh, very uh, dynamic. It looks like a streamlined architecture, which we didn't describe very well but it is a very clear trend in 1920-1930. The typology of the building is very special because the main entrance doesn't contain any elevator. You must go to the courtyard on the back of the building and then you have the elevator. This building, it is posed on uh, two shoulder, we can say, which is a traditional classic uh, German building, very heavy and very strong. But the corner is quite dynamic. This is a very important building still existing in Berlin. The expressionist architecture is quite um, wide, but we have to um, put into the discussion to the end. I want to touch um, the last author here, which is Luis Barragan. It is not expressionist architecture, it is not a pioneer of architecture on the 20th century, but he is a very important author because he is one of the most important architects in terms of minimalist. We have seen that Louis Miss van der Rohe generate one of the what is called nowadays minimalist architecture. So the um, progressive reduction of uh, the element of the composition uh, until the minimum. But in the case of uh, Barragan, this is uh, really the minimum possible. Barragan, the composition of Barragan is as less as possible. Look, for example, this uh, stair in his own apartment. It is nothing. It's just a zigzag piece of wood. Uh, the space of Baragan, it is very banal, but the tanks of the color, he generated dynamic. If you look at this, this picture, for example, the red wall seems to um, indicate something on the other side of the white wall. 
this kind of suspension atmosphere, this kind of minimal space. The colors are typical of the Mexican architecture, Mexican vernacular architecture, pink, red, um, blue, yellow. The color play a very big role in the architecture of Barragan. The light are always uh, uh, hidden by um, walls or facade. The windows are um, put into a very special place in terms to give a very uh, thin and very mysterious lighting. Um, I think Barragan is one of the great master in the minimalist architecture. I won't put in this section because uh, his work, it is uh, the direct uh, uh, consequences uh, of the minimalist architecture and purist architecture of Le Corbusier and Adolf, Adolf Loos and Miss van der Rohe.